Hello, David. How are you doing today? Uh, I am doing, doing great. Uh, it's nice to be here chatting with you. Yeah, absolutely. I was, I was only recently introduced to your work and I just started reading your books and read the most recent one. And yeah, I, at first I was like, oh no, is this going to be like the same thing? But it was different in that respect. So with, with this new book explaining kind of how men behave badly, like I'm always curious, like what inspired you? Like you've written so much on this topic. Like what, what made you think like we, I need a, I need a new book for this. Yes. Well, uh, well, you're absolutely right. I've been studying human mating strategies and published on them, uh, uh, over the past 30 years or so. Uh, but, um, the topic of conflict between sexes, that's the focus of the new book, uh, when men behave badly, the hidden roots of sexual harassment, mm -hmm. uh, uh, deception, harassment, and assault, uh, that, that this deserved, uh, it's such an important topic, mm -hmm. um, partly due to, uh, current cultural movements like the Me Too movement, uh, I'm going to be just, uh, yesterday, governor Cuomo in New York. Oh yeah. Resigned due to, um, being, uh, I, I believe convicted of, uh, uh, or, or found guilty of sexually harassing 11 women, Harvey Weinstein, or has been in the news, Bill Cosby, Jeffrey Epstein. Uh, and so, um, you know, problems in everyday life of sexual harassment of uh, deception in only dating, uh, sexual yeah. predators in only dating sites, sexual coercion, sexual assault, stalking, intimate partner violence. Uh, these are all, uh, forms of sexual conflict and in particular, they're forms of sexual conflict whereby males are attempting to bypass female choice, mm. you know, and, and I regard female choices like the number one law of mating that is females had evolved to uh, be choosy about when, where, with whom, and under what circumstances they consent to have sex. And men have evolved strategies, uh, some quite abhorrent to try to bypass, uh, that freedom of choice. And so I, my goal is, um, and, and I've never quite done this before in my work was very much a, a practical role that is the goal of eliminating on the sexual harassment, sexual coercion, intimate partner violence, stalking. And we can't do that without understanding the causes uh, of these phenomena. And so that's really what the book is focused on is identifying the causes, the underlying psychological machinery, um, why the sexes have been in conflict over the last, uh, billion plus years yeah. uh, since sexual reproduction evolved. Um, so, um, so that's, that's really the focus. And I've never really done that in any of my other books. Of course, I've touched on the topic of sexual conflict in my other books, but this, uh, this is focused laser like on that topic with the, that kind of practical goal in mind. Yeah. And, and it's, it's crazy. I've, uh, you know, I've been a guy just since I was younger, don't know why, like I've been friends with a lot of you know, women, right. And, and you, you hear about these statistics all the time, but like, it feels like just about every woman I've ever met, ever dated, you know, whatever there's been, uh, you know, uh, on the low end of the spectrum harassment, but in many cases, you know, sexual assault and things like that. So with like the goal of your book, because me just being around women and hearing these stories and I've worked in addiction treatment and a lot of people who start abusing substances, it's, you know, it started out with that kind of trauma and stuff. So with, with the goal of the book, like, cause I'm always kind of battling with this as well is like, is, do we think that like creating awareness and understanding will help us? I don't, I don't know what the next step is. Is it, is it acknowledging it then create solutions, creating awareness? Like, because at a certain point I'm like, do people not know, you know, that like some of these things are going on. So I'm curious your thoughts about that. Yeah. Um, well, I think that there is, uh, knowledge, uh, is, is a first step mm. and, and specifically knowledge of the fact that men and women have fundamentally different evolved sexual psychologies and in, in a, in a, uh, really profound sense, we are stuck in the interiors of our own minds and brains. And so we have to make inferences about what's going on in the minds and brains of other people. And when it's a member of the same sex, it's much easier because we share mm. these evolved, uh, 
features of sexual psychology, but when it's of the opposite sex. So for example, men trying to infer what's going on in women's minds and women trying to infer what's going on in men's minds, there are large gulfs, you know, and what, what I found in my research and that I highlight in the book is that both men and women are off in understanding the sexual psychology of the, of the other sex. So, um, you know, just to put it in a concrete example, um, men, uh, and this is what I found in my research, men underestimate how upsetting things, uh, sexual assault is, even mm-hmm. things like unwanted touching, groping, sexual harassment, men underestimate how upsetting that is to women, you know, and many men have the attitude of, oh, well, it's, you know, it's no big deal. You know, why is she getting so upset about it? But the fact is that these are efforts, as I mentioned, to bypass female choice. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's precisely why they're so upsetting, uh, to women, mm-hmm. and women have evolved to, um, defend against the things that we get upset about, things that we get angry about, uh, things that we are fearful of are things that have been dangerous to us over evolutionary time. So just, for example, we have evolved fears of snakes, spiders, darkness, heights, and these aren't random fears. These are, these are actual dangers. And then when you move into the social and mating and sexual realms, there are sexual dangers. Uh, and so men underestimate how upsetting these things are to women, but, and they also air in a variety of other ways. I'll mention one other and then, and then we can. Oh no, I love it. it. You go. Okay. (laughs) Okay. So, um, one of the things I highlight in the book, which is one, not the only, but one of the causes of sexual harassment is, uh, what I call the male sexual overperception bias. Mm, So that is a woman's classic example, woman smiles at a man or incidentally brushes up against his arm and he thinks, ah, she, she's really interested in me. She wants me. Yeah. And the woman of course might be being just friendly or polite or, you know, smiles an inherently ambiguous signal. I mean, it's sometimes it might involve, uh, sexual interest, uh, but sometimes not, you know, so, uh, but men tend to over infer sexual interest when it's not there. Uh, and, um, and, and. And one of the important points I'm going to make about that is it's not all men. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so that as we found in our lab research, uh, headed by a former graduate student of mine, now professor Karen Perlou, where that, um, men who are high on narcissism mm-hmm. uh, and men who pursue a short term mating strategy, that is, they're looking for casual sex are especially prone to this male sexual overperception bias. So one way to think about that is they think they're hot but they're not. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, and so this is, so, so it's not all, I, so I hope no one reads the book as a attempt to slam all men because it's not, yeah. it's not a book to slam men. It's in fact, a subset of men who commit the vast majority of, um, of acts of sexual violence mm-hmm. so, um, that are serial harassers. And that's why you have the male stuff like governor uh, Cuomo, if he is indeed guilty of what the 11 women charge me or, uh, or, uh, Jeffrey Epstein or, or Harvey Weinstein. We're talking about dozens or possibly in the case of Weinstein, possibly hundreds in the hundreds of victims of this and, and research on sexual harassment in the workplace shows the same thing. It's just a small subset of men who were committing or serial harassers. Yeah. Uh, and so it's not all men. In fact, most men, many men are applying those things morally abhorrent. You know, and that's one of the key points that, that I'd like to make in that I'm making the book is that men really need to join forces with women in eliminating this because most men don't want, you know, the women that they care about, their, their sisters, girlfriends, daughters, mothers, female friends to be victims uh, yeah. of sexual harassment. And so, uh, and so men need to get, get involved in this and getting back to your earlier question a deep knowledge of sex differences in our evolved sexual psychology is critical mm-hmm. in understanding that, uh, and, and, and eliminate that. Yeah. So, 
here's here's something that uh you know I, i'm curious about so a few weeks ago i had uh katherine sanderson on here she she wrote a book why we act how to be a moral rebel and a lot of it's about like speaking up or avoiding the bystander effect right and like you're saying like men we need to get involved and stuff like that and you know i i'm sure you know you're from you're pretty familiar with like the the stanley milgram obedience studies right yes so when when I hear these stories, right, uh, like you you brought up like Harvey Weinstein, or most recently we have you know Cuomo, or you know these these people of power. And whenever I see this, uh, I don't know if you did you hear about the recent story with Activision uh, Activision Blizzard, that uh, video game company. Hang on, hang on. Oh, so that's that's a big story too, and like dozens i believe dozens or even more women are coming forward about like this frat boy culture and like set a lot of harassment and all these other things right but whenever i see these stories in the workplace because you know other people knew about this right but i always think back to the milgram obedience studies and i know there's like some controversy about how they were conducted and people like debate about it but i'm like well it seems like people are so afraid of speaking to authority or losing their uh their 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 job or there's so many fears that they think that it's it's safer to stay quiet so i don't know how we incentivize people or get them to kind of recognize this when these huge huge things are going on yeah well that's great a great point and i think that you're right in your analysis that is it can be costly to speak up mm -hmm. uh, especially if the in this case, the sexual harassers in a position of authority, mm -hmm. uh, they can harm your career. But, um, but here's, here's a solution. So, and this is something my university recently instituted mm. so, kind of about sexual harassment in, in university context. So, um, uh, historically what it is, it has been up to the woman, uh, in this case, the victim of sexual harassment to report it, to document it, to, you know, if it comes to that, to you know, testify about it. Uh, and the change is that everyone else, this is now a university policy. This is, I'm at the University of Texas, that if, if anyone observes sexual harassment, they have to report it, uh, mm. you know, uh, even if they're not directly involved in it. And the actual threat is if you don't, you can lose your job. That's literally the, uh, yeah. you know, the, the potential penalty for failing to report observed sexual harassment. And so, and so this is an example where, uh, it does two things. One is changes the social norms, mm. you know, it, it makes it legitimate to report these things. And of course there, there's anonymity in, in reporting, you know, you, you don't have to, you know, necess the, the, the perpetrator doesn't necessarily find out who does it, which poses some dangers in and of itself that, yeah. that concern me. Uh, but the other thing that it does is, is it takes the burden off of the victim, uh, and sort of makes the uh, burden mm. on everybody to, you know, and, and so I think it changes the social norm yeah. uh, and makes it less costly to, uh, uh, speak up and, 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 and hopefully, uh, and, and my, you know, I, I'm not a big fan of having a million rules and regulations, but I think that these things that the change is just a social norm. Like yeah. if I see a guy, even if it's a friend, you know, or a colleague, you know, sexually harassing woman, they, Hey, this is not cool. You know, don't do that. And so rather than just leaving it up to the victim, uh, to, you know, marshal some kind of, uh, complaint or, or, or charge. Mm -hmm. So, so I think that things can be done. Uh, and again, this is another sex difference in our sexual psychology that men, uh, they, as I mentioned, they underestimate how upsetting this form of sexual harassment are to women. And they don't even, they, they perceive the same acts as less harassing than women do. So, oh, yeah. uh, you know, uh, and so their, their sex differences and sensitivities, and this goes against some trend some trends that i find kind of disturbing in the in the culture which is what i call sex difference denialism you know and i think that the the deniers of sex differences their their intentions are sometimes good because they're 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 worried that if we acknowledge that there are fundamental sex differences then somehow these will be used to discriminate against women um but i think in this case the opposite is true 
denying the sex differences actually harms mm -hmm. the half of the population that is most likely to be victimized by can you, can sexual you, violence. Can you explain what you mean by that a little bit, how it harms by not talking? Because that's something I've been really curious about lately. Uh, yeah, so, so here's, a, here's a concrete example. Um, uh, the um, laws about sexual harassment, they're written according to what's called the reasonable person standard. Mm. So there's this generic person. Would a reasonable person view this pattern of um, action as in a sexually harassed and mm -hmm. upsetting to, to the victim? Well, if it turns out that, as it does, that reasonable mm. women differ from reasonable men, Okay. Then this generic reasonable person standard is actually, well, how do you deal with it? What if you have a reasonable judge in the case or men who are reasonable men on the jury versus a, a female judge and females on the jury, they will adjudicate the same actions differently because they have different evolved sexual psychology. Got it. And so, so even at the level of kind of policy implementation, I think it would be Really, I'm not, I'm not a legal expert, you know, and I haven't talked to uh, legal scholars about how, how to deal with this in a yeah. way that's fair. Um, and, you know, the, the, the reasonable person standard was, it's, it actually comes from English law, you know, going back you know, prior to uh, American uh, United States law, that uh, the, the intent is, is good, you know, that is, in, and in many domains, a reasonable person standard is perfectly appropriate. But when it comes to the sexual domain and sexual crimes, a reasonable person's standard is not appropriate. So, yeah. uh, so because that's one example of how, how it harms women. Yeah, no, that, that makes total sense. I've been reading a lot of books lately, mainly talking about, you know, the, the debates and kind of the outrage over the conversation around genetic or gender differences and stuff. And there's the argument, you know, in, in those realms as well with like biology and stuff of, Hey, we need to talk about these because it could her people, I actually just finished an early copy of uh, Catherine Page Harden's book. It's called The Genetic Lo Lottery. Mm. And she talks about how like, you know, people like, oh, don't, don't start talking about those genetic differences because that becomes this slippery slope. And then, you know, but it's like, but if we avoid those, conver I see what you're saying. If we avoid those conversations, we're not recognizing these things. And and I know the law is tricky, but I think that'd be great if you if you have another book and you team up with a lawyer and start <laughs> to but here's, here's my question for you. I don't know if you've researched this at all, or I'm sure it's come across your mind. Uh, since I'm like a big psychology nerd, I'm always thinking about perception too, right? Mm -hmm. So just to throw an example out there, like I, I am no Brad Pitt. We know this, right? So bar, woman standing there, Brad Pitt walks up, says something, right? I walk up, say something perception is different. I think you touched on this in the book. I do. Right? Yes. So, so based on whether or not the person's attracted to you now, now here, I'm going to throw another thing your way, David. Okay. okay. Everybody's preference is different. And since we're talking about, you know, mating and all that stuff, I am into thicker women, right? So if a thicker woman came up to me and hit on me, right? And then a real skinny, like supermodel skinny, I wouldn't be attracted to her. So I would perceive those different. And one I might perceive as harassing, one I might not. So perception plays a big role. And this is just something that I think about because when we're talking about rules and stuff, and like you mentioned, like, you know, what you're doing on the university, like if, if a super attractive professor did that to a colleague, but then an unattractive one did the same thing, like, doesn't that get a little tricky since perception plays a role? Yes. Yeah. And I would say that in this case, uh, the, the perception is, uh, tied to our underlying sexual psychology. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's perception, not in the sense of just sort of visual input, but it's visual okay. input that's tied to our underlying sexual psychology. And, and, and yes, uh, there's research. I do talk about that in the book of it's not just physical attractive. Mm. So, uh, but that is one barrier. Uh, it's like status, so, another one, like status, status, status is another one. So, uh, so for example, if the janitor in the building, uh, you know, starts is sexually persistent, um, women find that more upsetting than if it's, um, you know, let's say, a a, a, a rock star or you know, yeah. whatever a rock star is a, maybe they expect that there's a difference to it, but status does make a difference with the qualification that if the person high in status happens to have power mm -hmm. over the victim, then that, then women find that very upsetting because 
this is a, uh, this is one of these situations that puts women in a very awkward, um, bind because they, let's say they want to, uh, reject this offer. So man, let's say a tour just says, I, I, I want to, uh, let's go out for a drink after work or let's go mm. on a date. Uh, or why don't you come back to my place? I have some etchings I'm going to show you. Um, that, that, that if the guy has power over her, then women often engage in what I call soft rejection. Mm -hmm. They say, you know, uh, oh, I'm, I'm busy. I can't do that. Or I have a boyfriend. Uh, so they try to communicate that they're not interested, but no, they don't say, uh, look, um, I'm, I have zero interest. You're a total loser and I'm rejected, <laughs> um, because the, the, they're, uh, as we kind of alluded to earlier, consequences for, uh, retaliation, which, which people sometimes do. Yeah. I actually talk about a case of that in the, in the book, in this true example involving, um, Bill O'Reilly and a woman that I happen to know, Wendy Walsh, where, uh, she was appeared on Fox news and in, in various segments as a, as an expert on relationships. And he said uh, to her, let's have dinner. I want to talk about your career and talk about having you, uh, becoming a regular on the show. Um, and so, uh, and so she thought this was fantastic. And then after dinner, he basically said, um, uh, I'd like you to come up to my room, yeah. uh, hotel room. And she declined. And he got very angry, apparently, according to her report and said, uh, well, you can forget about all that business advice I gave you. Yeah. Before. And they basically cut her out of the, uh, out of the TV show. And so this is an example where stunning men, uh, sometimes retaliate against women. Yeah. And so that puts women in this bind where if they're not interested and want to turn down the guy, but they also don't want to jeopardize their career, they have, they have this problem. That's why I think greater awareness is, uh, is critical. Yeah. And, and I'm curious too, like going back a little bit earlier, we were talking about the difference between what men perceive as flirting or this person's interested too. Right. So, so I don't know, like is so, okay, let's, let's go back to that example of, of Bill O'Reilly, because I, I think about all these factors, like if let's say you, Bill read your entire book and he realizes like, oh, I might be getting false signals at the fact that she agreed to dinner means that she's interested, right? So when she turns down going up to the room, he's like, okay, part of my sexual psychology is throwing me off here, okay? But then on top of that, uh, when I think about, you know, jealousy and, you know, you cover a lot of that in your book too, there's also this kind of uh, uh, more, you know, like, like our in-group status, right? Like what if somebody in Bill's circle found out that she turned him down too, right? So he has this want or need to be like, oh, well, I, the, 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 you know what I mean? So that yeah. kind of intertwines as well. So, uh, I guess basically what I'm asking is like, what, what would, what in a perfect world, what would the optimal like outcome of that scenario be where she interpreted, oh, we're talking about business and his sexual psychology is interpreting, you know, if I'm just giving him the benefit of the doubt that that wasn't just his intention the entire time, you know what I mean? What's, what's optimal here? Yeah, well, uh, well, so that's a good question, and, and I don't know if there are any uh, totally optimal solutions, but I think that um, uh, awareness, knowledge of something like the sexual overperception bias, yeah, um, is is critical here. So for for both men and women, so for men mm -hmm. to realize, well, if she agrees to dinner with me, if she smiles at me, that you know, I have this sexual overperception bias. And so maybe I need to be careful and, and find more cues before I conclude that she, in fact, is interested in me in that way, mm -hmm. sexually or romantically. Uh, and then women need to know also that men are likely to make this, uh, uh, here in sexual uh, misperception and, um, and that, uh, their, uh, uh, smiles or touches in, you know, incidental touches, however, like innocuous they may seem just knowledge that men sometimes misinterpret those, mm -hmm. um, yeah. will give them something, you know, make men aware of the differences, sex differences in our sexual psychology is critical to helping to bridge its gap. Now, is this an optimal solution? Does this magically cure all problems? No, of course not, but it's one step in the right direction.
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and part of the reason I asked so much of this stuff is because, you know, I have a 12 year old son. They just reopened the schools. They're going back for math and stuff. But he's he's 12. He's getting that age. And I remember before we figured out if he was a boy or a girl, like I was definitely afraid to have a, a girl because I know how guys can be. But now that I have a son, like I have this like, like, I need to teach this kid, right? <laughs> like, hey, your sexual overperception bias, we need to watch out and stuff like that. So that's one of the reasons I think books like yours are so important because I agree. Like once we acknowledge it, like, you know, I read the work of like, you know, Daniel Kahneman. I love reading books on biases and all these other things because I feel like it helps me pause and just be like, okay, is something in my brain skewing this? And and honestly, like, I, I, I almost think that having lower self-esteem in some situations, like me, when I was back in my single days and dating, I was like, I need like an over the top sign that this person is interested in me. You know, so sometimes self-esteem might be beneficial, but there was one part of your book where you brought something up and I think maybe this would be very helpful if people learn, but you talk about this kind of irreplaceable mate value. All right. So you have a lot of guys or you mentioned like incels in the book and stuff like that. And there's a lot of there's a lot of guys who try to date. They're like a six or a seven. Right. And they want a nine or a ten. Well, let's say that works out for them. Well, based on the irreplaceable and correct me if I'm wrong, but based on the irreplaceable mate value, if that lower status six of a person, whether it's status or physical attractiveness, they don't really have a guarantee that that person's going to stay because that woman might jump ship the second a more attractive or higher in status male. So is that an argument for these guys to start dating at their level? Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, yes, it is. Uh, <laughs> uh, that uh, I think that's one of the most important things. If you're interested in uh, an enduring uh, romantic relationship, then you have to pick someone who's within your mate value range. Now, main value is something, it's not, it's not a static entity, uh, in the sense that it changes with the, you know, the fortunes of time. I mean, people get sick, they get injured, they get a job promotion, they, they publish a best-selling novel, whatever. There are yeah. rises and falls in, in status and mate value. Uh, and so, but, um, but the, the guy who's a six coming after a woman who's an eight or a nine, even if he is fortunate enough to attract her in the short run, she's statistically more likely to cheat on him and more likely to trade up in the mating market, you know, when the opportunity arises. Yeah. Uh, and so I think for both men and women, selecting a mate within your mate value range is critical. Yeah, no, I, I think that that's so, that's so important. And, and, and yeah, I just, I want, if anybody it takes away anything from this conversation, I hope it's that it's like, here's a good reason to date in your range. You know what I mean? Because yeah, like just the yeah. way we're, we're kind of wired, but here's so, so we can, we can go just, if I could add a qualification yeah. to that. Um, so what we're talking about here is a consensual mate guy that is, that is agreed mm. upon if you have a hundred people in the room. Okay. And assess the mate value of A versus B, there would be a fair amount of consensus. Okay. But there are also individual differences in mate value. So I know one woman, for example, who mm. um, is, uh, she's a, uh, a Slavic scholar and she really places a high priority on a guy who has deep knowledge of Russian literature. So she can have these high level discussions. Now, this is a, you know, an individual mate for most. Most people don't have this as a key quality that they're looking for in a mate, but she does. And, and, and so there are individual differences and that's very fortunate because that, what that means is somehow uh, yeah. is can be higher in mate value to you, but not necessarily to other people. I see what you mean. Got it. So, so for example, like, you know, uh, if, if like, I'm really good at fixing cars and a girl grew up, you know, liking mechanics or something, then maybe, you know, right. my hip, like if we have a bunch of different like levels, I, I play video games. So I'm thinking about like stats, right? So like maybe it's like a track <laughs> yeah. down here, but auto repair or whatever is up here. Maybe that can help, right. that can help kind of balance it out. So, so yeah, maybe we just need to be better at a, a, assessing it. And, and that, that segues into something I've been dying to ask you since I read, you know, your, your previous books too, because there's this like kind of idea, like we, let's just take any just like typical man or woman, wherever they're at on the attractiveness scale. Some people, you know, my background's in mental health and stuff. And there's this idea like, oh my God, I'm going to be single forever. I'm never going to find anybody. 
And I, I've always just had this idea. I'm just like, I don't think that that has any type of like reality to it. I think that everybody can find someone. It's about finding the right mate value and matching it up. I feel like that's a lot of the issues with people not being able to, you know, attract like, you know, a long-term mate or even like a casual hookup. You know what I mean? So, you know. so like based on your experience, have you ever met, <laughs> this is a weird question. Have you ever met somebody you're like, oh no, nobody will ever be attracted to you because I just, I just don't see that as the case. Like I was a drug addict for almost a decade and I still found people, even though my life was a mess. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I'm yeah. like, if, if I could do that back then, I think sure. there might be hope for you. You just got to find the right people. Yeah. Yeah. I would say, uh, and sorry, uh, I would say the answer is, uh, yes, uh, for the most part, um, all of their ex exceptions and an important social context called sex ratio, which I'll, which I'll mm. mention in, in a minute, but. Um, but just as sort of a personal anecdote, um, when I did the, my very first study of, uh, of, uh, this was, uh, married couples, uh, and, uh, what we did is we brought them into the lab and we had a male and female interviewer and we interviewed the couples. And then after we interviewed them, we rated on them on a variety of characteristics independently. So, uh, the personality characteristics who had more power in the relationship, who talked more, but also how physically attractive well, mm. is this individual and um why and one of the things that we found is that there were when we got to the physical attractiveness rating of this one couple uh you know we kind of looked at each other because it was like it's like the guy was a one <laughs> you know, the one that seven scale one to ten scale uh and uh you know and and the woman was a bit higher but they they were married to each other. So, yeah. um, so, so even, even, um, people who are relatively unattractive people can find others, uh, but here's the qualification, sex ratio. So the extreme example was in, is in uh, mainland China right now with the, the cohort where that, um, uh, was under the one child policy. Yeah. So they, they favored male children over female children. So there's. But in this cohort, a surplus of men, and now they're a uh, mating age and there aren't enough women to go, to go around. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, and so when you're, when you have an extreme sex ratio imbalance, in this case, a surplus of men, no, not everybody is going to succeed in finding oh, a mate. Okay. Yeah. That makes and, sense. Uh, and, but, and this relates to a more general point and then to an earlier point that we were discussing. Uh, about mate value is that different environments, even within, within our culture, have different sex ratios within them. So for example, one of the things I talk about in, in the new book is what I call the mating crisis among educated women. Yeah. Um, and, and that is that it is the fact that at colleges and universities in both, uh, uh, North America and throughout most of Western Europe, more women than men are getting higher degrees. They're getting more educated both at the college level and at the higher degrees. And so at the, at the undergraduate level and at the graduate level, to some degree, there's a sex ratio imbalance. So people tend to find mates from their work pool. That's one of the main sources. Uh, but there are exceptions. So the exceptions are engineering. Schools. So Caltech or MIT, there's a surplus of men. Okay. And so. I can just just a practical piece of advice for, for your son when he yeah, reaches yeah. college age, my, when I look at the sex ratios of the colleges, uh, he's applying to, uh, and see for, for women, you know, that is the rarer sex, uh, has an advantage in the mating market. Yeah. I uh, and, uh, and, and example from a talk that I gave not too long ago at Texas Christian university, a former student of mine's a professor there, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Sarah Hill and she invited me to give a talk. And so I was chatting with the undergraduates and the women told me there's a t TCU, Texas Christian university, there's 60% women, 40% men. Mm -hmm. uh, and the women basically said a guy who's normally a five in any other context is an eight at TCU. Yeah. And then when I talk to guys who had formerly gone to TCU, they get this kind of glazed look in their eyes as they fondly remember this one time in their life when they were high in meat value. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, so, 
So the, the sex ratio environment is critical and varies tremendously with subculture. So you mentioned gaming culture. Well, my understanding is that that's a culture, subculture, where there's a, a surplus of men yeah. relative to women in that culture. You know, there, so, so, um, picking, uh, if you want to succeed in mating, one piece of advice is pick a, uh, a social environment where you are the rarer sex. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. And that's hilarious that you bring that up about TCU. I went, when I went up to uh, junior college, it was in this tiny town in Northern California called Quincy. You're just driving through the forest. All of a sudden there's a town population was like 1500, right? But it was like that as well. And there was, uh, it was a, it was kind of a sports school. I went up there originally for football and there was a lot more men than women. And like, you know, women were much more attractive than if you were in a, a bigger city or, or something like that. And that's interesting. And I'm curious too, is that does that explain any type like i know there's a million factors such as like substance use and stuff does that explain any of the high higher rates of sexual violence on college campuses do you think like with some of these like have you looked at that like is it happening at schools where there's a lower percentage of women and more competition among men or anything like that yeah i haven't looked uh looked at that and i've not aware of studies of that specifically but it wouldn't surprise me if that occurred because one of the other things is when you get a surplus of women, the whole mating system tends to shift more toward a short-term mating situations mm -hmm. and casually hooking up sin. And so I think a lot of the hookup culture on some college campuses do, is due to sex ratio imbalance. And so what happens then is um, women compete with each other for the smaller number of men that are available. And one of the ways in which they compete is by dressing in sexier clothing, mm. skin, skimpier, more tight fitting clothing, and also signaling sexual availability. And, I, and, and so this sometimes puts women in social contexts where they might be at risk of, of, of sexual violence. But, but again, this is, that's a speculation. I don't know yeah. of any empirical studies that have documented that. Yeah. And that, that would be tricky too, with that over-perception bias too, when you have women right. dressing more sexual. Uh, yeah. So, so I, yeah, that'd be an interesting study if someone did it. And something else, I, I cannot find an answer to this, David. And I was like, when I talk to him, I have to ask. So, <laughs> so I'm, I'm 36 years old, right? Millennial and. As I mentioned, I know uh, uh, a lot of women. I've had friends. I've been friends with women since junior high, high school. Yeah. And we're now adults today. And I'm sure you've seen this, but there is a growing number of women uh, around my age who do not want children, right? But based on just about everything I understand about evolutionary psychology, it's all about mating. Like everything's about mating and reproducing, but there's so many women who do not want children right. with demographic. Right. So, well, first of all, just a clarification, it's, it's all about mating, but uh, not, not reproducing. Okay. So, so in other words, all, all the selection, uh, evolution by selection built in to us is, uh, a desire for sex, okay. uh, a desire, uh, an attraction toward people with particular qualities, such as fertile individuals, uh, and then reproduction happen. Uh, so you don't, don't have to, uh, evolution didn't have to build in a desire to reproduce, you know, oh, okay. um, so it's, and start point, not the, not the sex. Well, then. well, well yeah, in, in, in another way of, of putting that is that our sexual psychology is the end product of a long and unbroken chain of ancestors each of whom succeeded in the mating game. They succeeded in attracting a mate, succeeded in attracting a mate long enough to have sex with that mate, uh, and long enough to reproduce with that mate. Um, and so we are descendants of this chain of successful ancestors. So we carry with us the mating psychology that led to their success, mm. but that doesn't, it's not forward looking. that, so in other words, it's, it's not saying. And this is a, it's an easy conflation that a lot of PhDs make this, uh, error. They think that, uh, but there should be like a goal of maximizing reproductive success. Right. And no, there's no goal of maximizing reproductive success. It's just, um, attract, uh, individuals who are reasonable and mate value within your range and do all the things you need to do. Uh, so, so, but, but you're absolutely right. There's this trend and it's not just in the United States, uh, there are lower rates of 
actual reproduction uh, in uh, throughout Western Europe and also then uh, some Asian cultures such as uh, Japan uh, and uh, South Korea uh, to some degree where they're below, uh, even, even in Italy, the reproductive rate is below the placement level. Uh, and in the United States, uh, it, 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 the people here are also reproducing below placement level, but we have, uh, in, there, we have immigrants coming in and they reproduce and that sort of balances it out. So we're not, you know, net, we're not losing uh, a net population numbers in our culture, but they are, uh, in Italy, uh, and it might happen in the United States as well, you know, because people who. Uh, come from cultures where they historically had a larger number of children become acculturated to American life and start having fewer children. So, so this is, this is a worldwide, um, issue, uh, I shouldn't say worldwide, it doesn't occur in all cultures, but something that is a great concern, uh, just even from a practical level, because you have a, a shrinking workforce and kind of ballooning yeah. old people who were on social security and, and so the, 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 this has economic consequences you know, as well. Yeah. It's, it's really interesting. And like, I'm not, uh, I'm far from an epi- economics guy, but I hear about, you know, we're talking about technological advances and AI taking jobs and stuff like that. And then I'm thinking about less people being born. Like, is that gonna kind of balance it out? Like if, if less jobs are available and we're automating more things, is that Anything that we've looked at? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I haven't, um, you know, and and who knows where things will end up in the future? You know, yeah. Uh, it's uh, uh, risky to make predictions uh, too, yeah. far, too far out. You, know, you go a year or two out, uh, five years, ten years. Who knows? I mean, I don't think anyone could have predicted, for example, twenty years ago that um, there would be something like Facebook, you know, right. or, or Twitter. Uh, no one could predict these things, or that. Everybody is walking around with a very high powered computer in their pocket in the form of a cell phone, um, uh, that can put them in touch with, you know, anyone around the world, uh, yeah. thousands of potential mates on dating sites, um, et cetera. No one could have predicted these things. So who knows what's going to happen 10 years from now? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I, I just finished a book about, you know, climate change and stuff like that. And it was talking, you know, we don't know what technological advances might help stop climate change. But then I also think about the population and, you know, well, that, but that's a, that's a whole thing that, <laughs> that gets complex and hurts my brain. But uh, speaking of, speaking of Twitter, we talked about this briefly on Twitter, but as I was reading your book, I had this question and you, you said it's, it's helped some women like your book, right? Like, cause my concern when I'm reading, when I'm reading the book and earlier we were talking about, you know, the goal of the book, what is it and educating and, you know, teaching people about, you know, this sexual psychology and stuff like that. And, you know, I, I look very scientifically. I just try to leave out my biases and emotions and just like look at it for what it is. But my concern is that some of it's like, oh, hey, guys are, guys are just going to do this, right? So I'm curious, you know, like women, uh, you know, who have been uh, assaulted or women who are worried about the climate and the workplace and all these things, like, has it been helpful for them? Have people mentioned like a victim blaming aspect at all? Like, I'm curious. The yeah. Thing yeah. Thing's not- no, no, the, re- the reception, uh, to my, my book, when men behave badly has been very, uh, warmly received by women. So mm. there've been a number of women who have reviewed it. Um, uh, some from, uh, for example, in the UK, my book came out under just slightly different title for reasons that we can get into if you're interested, but we don't have to. <laughs> no, but, no, but, no. Uh, it's called, but in the UK, it's Bad Men with the same subtitle, mm. Hidden Roots of Sexual Deception, Harassment, and Assault. But um, there's a, a kind of a, a apparently a left-wing publication called The New Statesman in the UK, and they published a very, written by a woman, published a very favorable a uh, strongly favorable review the book and said, basically, uh, and a number of women said this, they're going to give this book to their teenage daughters to read. Uh, and hopefully people give it to the teenage sons to read as well. well Other people have said, um, like one co- colleague who read the book said, like, this should be required reading for all fre- incoming freshmen oh, at reading sure. college, because it's valuable information. So, uh, so, but, but no, I, I think I take themes in the book 
to avoid victim blaming. Uh, so, so even things like, uh, you know, it, it's an interesting phenomenon when it comes to sexual violence, because like if someone gets mugged, you're walking down the street, someone gets mugged, no one blames the victim, right? It's a, it's a, it's a crime that's defined by the act, but it's unfortunate that sexual violence uh, was when a woman gets, uh, raped or sexually assaulted, sometimes they do blame or even sexually harassed. They think, well, what was she here? Uh, is, what, what is her, how many sex partners has she had previously? Uh, and I think we need to shift the mindset on that because, uh, sexual assault is, is a crime and there is a victim. Now, are there attributes of victims that make them more vulnerable to sexual assault? Yeah. We know, for example, drinking alcohol is, is one of them. Drinking alcohol, it disables women's, uh, uh judgment and decision-making. Uh, and it also impairs her physical though. So you, you're mm. physically weaker when you've, when you've had a number of drinks. And so women are less able to fend off or, or even accurately perceive that a sexual assault might be done. Now, this is not to blame the woman because the sexual assault, of course, is still a crime committed by the man. Uh, and that should be clear, but nonetheless, um, you know, women, um, you know, should be aware that certain things put them in danger. I and mean, if they go alone to a, a frat party where there are these, uh, red solo cups of, with unknown, uh, mixtures in them, unknown concentrations of alcohol, they need to be careful. And one of the things I talk about, and I think one of the most important chapters in my book is women's defenses against yeah. sexual coercion. Uh, and I talk about about a dozen of those. And one of the most important ones is bodyguards. So, uh, so in other words, the woman's, um, friends, family, male friends, female friends, coalitional allies, people who by their mere presence deter sexual aggression. Uh, and, uh, and, and so and any guy who is contemplating sexual aggression, uh, will be, will be deterred by that. And if they do try it, then the woman has these bonding guards. Uh, and, and so in a, in a weird way, and this is what I call an evolutionary mismatch. I didn't invent the term, of course, but the, the conditions under which we evolved are very different from the conditions in habit, right? No. And so for example, women go off to college and university, uh, where they don't have any friends necessarily, or, and they're far away from their families they were mm. kin, and their friends and family, the formerly provided these bodyguards, you know, a, a suite of coalition allies. Uh, and so the woman is uh, more vulnerable. And, and, and so we find, and I highlight this in the book that fresh women are especially vulnerable because it's a totally novel environment and they're not used to the, uh, the dangers in that environment. And so as women they get to be sophomores, junior, seniors, the, the, the victimization rates decline, uh, in part because women become more, um, savvy about navigating this novel environment. But I think just, uh, not only this is why, uh, I, I have a daughter and, uh, and I'm having to read the book, I'm yeah. gonna, you know, and, uh, you know, men to be care about women, um, and, you know, as I mentioned, their female friends, their daughters, sisters, and so forth need to have this information, uh, yeah. with that goal, uh, want to reduce, ideally eliminate sexual violence. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think you explained that well, and I, and, and I agree, I think you did an excellent job in the book. Like I, and maybe it's just because I'm very like mindful of like how you've, you've seen how things can explode and people get offended or outraged. And are you saying, you know, are you saying we're to blame or men are just going to be like this, but I think you did an excellent job breaking it all down. But I think of it, you know, all, for example, I'm not a camper. And if I was going to a new area and went camping, I'd want to, I'd want to know like what these bushes mean, if there's going to be poison ivy, you know, just to be aware. So I can kind of avoid it or prepare and stuff like that. Um, because, because yeah, uh, that's, that's one of my fears. Like, um, when I was working in addiction treatment and stuff, uh, because a lot of people who become addicted to substances, they're victims of trauma a lot of people victims of sexual abuse from childhood and stuff and there's this balance of like uh you know i'm the son of an alcoholic mom where it's not my fault 
But now it's like, I can be aware of my situations. Now that I'm older, I have more control and the more I educate myself. And I live in Las Vegas and I have to learn about all the stuff going on so I can guard myself from a relapse. So that's kind of how I try to explain it. And a lot of people do take it better than, than some. They're like, oh, you know, it's not my fault that this happened to me. And, you know, it's like, I know, I know, but we got to control what we can. Is that kind of what you, you try to teach your daughter and, and yeah, others? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I mean, you, you could say if like one reaction could be, well, in an ideal world, mm. um, you know, it shouldn't matter. Women can dress any way they want, act any way they want, uh, uh, slim 12 Jägermeisters anytime they want. Um, uh, uh, but you know, it's, it, uh, we don't live in that ideal world. You know, we live in a world where there are, um, real, uh, sexual dangers out there, you know? So, and we, we've talked about sexual harassment, we've talked a bit about sexual assault and defenses against that. In the book, I also go into intimate partner violence, which is mm -hmm. another form of sexual violence. So, um, you know, which is during the pandemic, uh, increased dramatically. So estimates are. The rates of intimate partner violence blown up by about 20% during the pandemic, uh, due to, especially in the lock in situations yeah. where women are basically stuck with a guy, um, that they were on the verge of leaving or in the process of leaving. Uh, and, uh, and that's often the case though. The reason I call, uh, this physical violence, a form of sexual violence is because the goal of the abuser is often mate guarding or mate keeping when well, he wants to keep the woman mm -hmm. um, for himself and prevent her from uh from leaving and so that's again a, a means of bypassing female choice yeah so, so uh and yeah sir no 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 uh it it reminds me because uh that, i think that's one of the the phenomena that just confused me uh or did until i read your book is is stalking right and that, uh, I believe you said is that's also a form of mate guarding and occupying the woman, like the goal is kind of occupying the woman's time. So it decreases the amount of time she could have to meet a potential other mate. Is that kind of the well, close of the mind, right? Well, so, so this stalking is, um, not all stalking is mating related, but a lot of it, it's majority of it is in, and one of the largest categories is, um, a woman who has a left a relationship. So she's moved out uh, and the guy starts the, to stalk her. So, well, a couple of things there. Okay. One is that, uh, in our study of, uh, 2,500 victims of stalking, what we found is that the stalker is lower in mate value than the victim of stalking. And so part of the male psychology is a realization that he will never be able to replace her, uh, effectively. He's lost someone. He was. He's in a, you know, and so, but the, the goal is often either to try to get her back, uh, which, um, doesn't happen in the high frequency, yes. it's rare. Um, but also to interfere with her future mating efforts. So, uh, and the unfortunate thing is it's bi diabolically effective in the sense of like guys are deterred. So, you yeah. know, shows up and she says, oh, oh, don't mind my ex. He's spying on us with binoculars, you know, he's got some weapons in his car. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm a, you know and the guys say, look, I, I really like you, but call me when you get rid of your stock. I mean, it's, you know, it can be a frightening, frightening thing. And, and so the, the diabolical conclusion is that sometimes it is effective in interfering with the woman's attempts to remake, you know, one woman actually said in our study, um, this, uh, her ex basically threatened every guy that she saw. And after six months, she ended up going back to her, to her ex because there were no other guys. Yeah. He just iced her out from every yeah, successfully, um, repelled all other potential mates. And so it's like, you know, directed towards her and also directed toward interfering with these other attempts to remake. Yeah. Uh, and I saw, I go into the, the underlying psychology of that. And also in that chapter, I offer victims of stalking yeah who, who are cantiful by the way um uh, a set of uh, sort of best practices advice on how to deal with stalking if you're a victim of it and we even have and i cite this in the book a website that we created devoted to helping victims of stalking it's called stalkinghelp.org yeah. and the purpose has just a number of uh 
It's a, it's a resource for people to stop and you know, what to do about it. Got it. Yeah. I, I remember you mentioned that. I'm glad you brought it up again because I'm going to put that in the description. But yeah, it, it's, it's crazy. It, it blows my mind because one of the worst things is that, like you mentioned, it is effective. So, you know, the more tools people have to kind of not let that happen, um, you know, or prevent it. And, and yeah, it bumps me out too, because just even, uh, you know, women I've known who have uh, had stalkers and stuff, the, the legal route isn't even always the best thing because you need, you know, a certain amount of evidence or proof or this to happen. And sometimes it's just too late. So, so yeah, it feels like there's a few things that need to happen, but you know, whatever resources people can have to kind of navigate it. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I, I want to keep you all day. I literally have like 20 more things, but I want people to go get this book. So before I let you go, I'm going to hit you with one more question, David. Okay. So I'm gonna, let me preface this first. So one of my things, right, growing up and, you know, it was probably the, al- there, there's a whole bunch of stuff I've gone through therapy for and stuff like that. Like probably my alcoholic mom, but I, I always needed a relationship, right? Led me to a lot of toxic relationships. And I see that a lot with people and the best thing i ever did david like was for like a year it was actually the year i got sober because there's this rule like in 12-step programs so like don't date for a year right best thing i ever did because it rewired me to kind of know like oh you'll survive when you're single right but anyways uh it seems like one of the biggest things affecting people in their mental health is like this this insane fear of loneliness right so they'll they'll jump into terrible relationships or toxic relationships and i'm just curious like from your perspective like like i get it we want to you know have mates and stuff like that but why is it so difficult for us to stay single like is there anything we could do has your research found anything have you come across any studies like that will help us just be okay being single until we find somebody with the right mate value yeah, oh, well, it's a it's a good question. Well, I think it's one of these examples though where uh, where there's a mismatch. I mean, we evolved to be successful leaders. Uh, <laughs> to stay single is very difficult. I mean, as I mentioned, we're the descendants of the long and unbroken line of successful maters, you know. Um, and so that's what we evolved to do. If we were asexual, like some species are, we wouldn't have to bottle it, you know. That you don't have to go through this diabolical and a complicated process of mate selection, mate attraction, mate keeping and all that. But we're a sexually reproducing species. And that's why I think I view and it's maybe, you know, this cliche, you get some of hammer and the world seems full of nails that need to be pounded. Well, that's what I feel about mating. It's like the center of the universe yeah. related to everything. Uh, and so, uh, and in, in, you know, we're an extremely social species. We didn't even evolve to be alone. Yeah. You know, we evolved to, to live in groups and to find mates. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's so difficult. And I, I don't know if we're going to kind of catch up evolutionarily to that point, but I actually stayed single, uh, and celibate for like 18 months and it kind of just broke this spell. I'm like, Oh, I survived. Okay. And I was able to, I was able to be like, okay, well, instead of going after threes, like on a psychologically stable level, I can go after like sixes and sevens, you know what I mean? And my current girlfriend, you know, it's the healthiest relationship I've been in. So, but a lot of people I've noticed that they just, they can't stay single long enough to find that one. And, and sometimes you're stuck in a situation, like you mentioned that, that one young woman where a stalker repelled everybody. Right. So someone, you know, where she might've found somebody more psychologically healthy they were deterred and so it's 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 tricky but uh yeah it's something that i try to teach people like just learn how to be okay being single for at least a little bit but anyways david thank you so much and uh yeah before i let you go uh if there's any any other resources like the stalking help one or like where can people find you i found you and we connected on twitter like where's the best way to keep up with you your research if you end up writing another book like you have you to keep people busy okay i well well, i do so well well, first of all i just uh, you read your listeners might be interested in the cover uh the this one so it's kind of a cool cover i didn't like it of course i'm bad at that but um, (laughs) when men behave badly uh, I would say an, another key book, uh, so I've written about seven books or so, uh, and I would say uh, another key book is my book, The Evolution of Desire, yeah. Strategies of Human Mating, because that kind of gives an overview of all the strategies of human mating, mm. whereas the current book focuses on the issue of conflict between the sexes. That book gives an overview of tactics of attraction, tactics of mate retention. People can find me 
by just uh, Googling my name, davidbuss.com, B-U-S-S-T-S, it's not, not the school bus, bus. <laughs> the school bus. Uh, but davidbuss.com, and that will bring you to my, my, uh, my webpage. And on the webpage, there are links to all my books, and there are also links to my scientific articles, which can be downloaded for free. Um, and also links to like the Stalking Health website um, and, and other resources. So, um, so davidbuss.com, um, you know, will take people to those resources. Beautiful. Yeah. And I'll link all that down below. So yeah, thank you. I'm, I've been anticipating this for a while and you did not disappoint David. So thanks so much for joining me. Well, thank you. It's been a delight to chat with you and, and hope we can, uh, meet up and chat again sometime. Absolutely.